We are in a servanthood series. We've been dealing with it for several weeks, and I'm going to continue in this vein, but I'm shifting because servants need to be consecrated. We've already established that. Today, I want to take it a little bit further without further ado and no bells and tricks and whistles and things like that. And I want to get to the heart of the matter. Can you say fasting? Fasting. Fasting is an essential part of consecrating oneself for God's service. Periodically, we've already established that we should be consecrating ourselves unto the Lord. And he desires for us to do this. Fasting is one of those things that show up in the Bible without any definitions. It's kind of like assume that you know what it is, right? And so in order to really touch what it is and to get a better understanding, a lot of times what you have to do is you have to read the whole Bible and try to pull up every instance of fasting, all right? And you look at, the, look at it contextually, and you go from there. And I know we're not going to do that today. I kind of saved you some of that, all right? And I'm going to uh, kind of uh, filter out some things and give you meat this morning. Now, today, if you're watching us on the Internet, this is a good teaching to go back and listen to it over and over and over because I'm going to be giving a lot of information today. Can you shout a lot of information? A lot of information today. Uh, you will have to chew it a little bit. You'll have to put your spiritual dentures in. Make sure that the effervescent cream is properly uh, attached to the dentures and gum tissues so that you can chew properly the Word of God. And if you don't chew it now, chew it a little bit later like a cow does. You know, a cow chews the cud and it, they chew it over and over and over. And sometimes you have to what? Regurgitate it and sh chew it again. And so uh, we're going to chew a little bit on this concept of servanthood, consecrate by fasting, consecrate by fasting. Uh, it's one of the most powerful spiritual disciplines that a Christian can perform. You hear about prayer a lot, don't you? Right? And we engage in prayer a lot. I think we do, right? Okay. How many, well, don't raise your hand, but how many of you pray in front of your children? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. How many of you pray in front of your children? Don't just, don't even just, just look straight. Okay? It's important to pray in front of your children. I'm concerned because I'm seeing a generation that's being raised in church, but they're not of church. And I was in prayer, Whitney, seriously, because I know you... You're going to be dealing with the young people, Kanina. And I started praying for you guys because, unfortunately, can I tell you something? You're going to be the first line of Christianity for some of these girls who have Christian parents. And it's, it's bad to say that, that they're not really getting it at home. I mean, it's the truth. Because the parents are not exemplifying Christian principles at home. They come to church, they look like Christians, and they, they know the jargon. But when the children hit 16, 17, and 18, all of them should not be leaving. Christian, Christian principles and being swayed that easily when they go to college. Can we just talk? That's why you come to New Birth, you like the truth, you like just let's talk about it. So some of us, we say we pray before our children because the children have to learn how to pray. Here's my next question. Do your children know that you fast? Have you ever fasted in front of your child? You know, the child says, are you eating today? No, I'm going to fast. And they ask you, what is that? Don't have those conversations ever happened in the house? food for thought. What is fasting? The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology says this, fasting is the act of total or partial abstinence of food for a limited period of time, usually undertaken for 
moral or religious regions, reasons. In the book, Prescription for Nutritional Healing, fasting is an effective and safe method of detoxifying the body. The body needs a periodic rest from the toxic chemicals we ingest and absorb from our environment. Fasting is not starvation. It is a technique that wise men have used for centuries to heal the sick. To understand the principles of fasting is to understand one's own body. Derek Prince, a very popular contemporary Christian author, who's written many, many books I've read, and I took one quote from his book on fasting. Fasting intensifies prayer. Say that with me. Fasting intensifies prayer. Holman Bible Dictionary says this. It describes three main forms of fasting. Here's the first one. The normal fast involving total abstinence of food. Luke chapter 4 verse 2 says Jesus did eat nothing. He didn't eat anything. Okay. Then you have what's called the absolute fast. You see this in scripture. Involving total abstinence of food and water. This is Pastor Ruth and we, this is what we do. Total, you have to build up to this, and we'll be talking about this in days on. Uh, total abstinence of food and water. You see it in Acts 9 and 9. Uh, Paul said this, for three days he, Paul, was blind and did not eat or drink anything. That's the absolute fast. Then you have what's called the partial fast that I encourage you to encourage your children to do. Uh, involving the diet here, I'll say involving uh, the restriction of diet rather than complete abstinence. We have to teach our children about fasting also. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 2, Daniel described his own fast that produced insight on the future. He says, I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. He was involved in a fast. This is a question that I get. I've been teaching on this for 20-something years. I was even asked years ago to go to a church. They heard that I was teaching on fasting to actually go to the church and teach the church about fasting. But this is a popular question that I get all the time. It says, what does food have to do with my spirituality? Okay, that, that's, that's about a four-part series. And I'm going to give you a short answer. Food is a connector to your appetites, desires, your wants, and your pleasures, literally and figuratively. I'll say it again. Food is a connector to your appetites, your desires, your wants, and your pleasures, literally and figuratively. The stomach in ancient times has been seen as the vehicle for pleasure, and it's a venue for the appetite. Philippians 3 17 through 19 says this. <clears throat> Join together in following my example, Paul says, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. In other words, don't follow slothful Christians or Christians who are apathetic about their relationship with God. Follow people who are on fire for Jesus. That's what he's telling them here, okay? Look at 18, 18, Paul says this. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many, and he's speaking to Christians here, guys. He's not speaking to sinners. He's not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to Christians. He says, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. 19 is where I want to land. He says, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their, their mind is set on earthly things. Since ancient times, people of God, the stomach has been known to be a connector. And our, our sinful nature connects with our appetites. And if allowed, and we kind of touched on this weeks ago, if allowed, 
your sinful nature, the carnal nature, will hijack your appetites. It's okay to have an appetite. Appetite to love. It's okay to have that. But if the carnal nature hijacks that appetite, now we have problems. The stomach, the stomach is the primal place for a Christian who wants to exercise discipline. The stomach. Most of us, we start off the day talking about, okay, well, what are we going to eat for tonight? It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Oh, so what are we going to have for dinner, hon? Truth of the matter is you could skip two or three days of eating dinner, and it wouldn't even hurt you. Food brings pleasure. It's supposed to be for nourishment. And we say, food, I have to have food. We have to eat nourishment and vitamins and nutrition. Well, then, why don't you eat a raw carrot, a raw potato, some grass, and some plankton or something? That would get you through and give you what you need. But no, we want it cooked up with gravy, <laughs> cheese, herbs. Why? Because we want the pleasure principle. If it were, if it were all about nutrition, hey, let's go outside, pick up some grass over here. But it's not based on pleasure. The Bible gives us a scripture that says that sin brings pleasure too. The pleasures of sin are for a season, the scripture says. I had a debate with a young man about blessings, and I shared it with my wife, and I says that I ripped him apart. He just really didn't know his Bible, of course. It's amazing how people look at something on the internet and they call it true. <laughs> You're like, okay, where'd you guess so? You got it from YouTube. Oh, wow. <sighs> he blessed, well, see, if I'm blessed, God gave it to me, see, because the Bible says that the Lord reigns on the just and the unjust and all this kind of stuff. Yep, sure, sure does. The Bible also says that the pleasures of sin are for a season. And I said, have you ever read Matthew chapter 4? Well, what is that? So you need to go back and read it. Well, Jesus was tested. And in that testing, one of the tests was that if you do this and you worship me, I'll give you bread. And then if you worship me again, Satan says this to Jesus, if you do, if you bow down, you bow the knee down to me, I will bless you. All the kingdoms will be yours. Question is, is where are your blessings coming from? Just because you have money doesn't mean came from the Lord. Just because you have influence doesn't mean it came from the Lord. Satan, you know, he hooks up his people too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. So we have to be careful with this appetite thing, and it has to be under control. Can you say under control? Most of our problems happen in life is because we're out of control. We don't have control over our desires and our appetite and what we want and what brings us pleasure. James 1, 13 through 15 says this. When tempted, no one should say, God has tempted me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he even tempt anyone. 14 says, but each person shall it real loud. Everyone, everyone. Say it. Say it again. Everyone, everyone. everyone. Look at your neighbor and say, this means you. But each person is tempted when they are, watch this, 
dragged away by their own evil desire and entice. 15, check this out. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown, which means now in the economy of God, God, do you not know that he will allow you to continue on in some things? And he will try to work with you and work through this. Come on, you know that wasn't right. Don't do it again. But you keep on pressing. You just keep doing it. And then it becomes full grown. It becomes a beast. And then here we go with addictions and habits that we don't have control over. It. And it's, it's just whack. Fasting is a way to bring our hedonistic nature, which is a life devoted to the pursuit of pleasure and self-gratification. It's a, it's a way to bring that hedonistic, carnal, flesh nature, our sinful nature, and appetites under control. When you start out simple with telling your body, you know what, at 12 o'clock, Midnight, I am not going to eat until 3 o'clock the next day. You tell yourself that, immediately you get a headache. Immediately, you, oh, well, I should have eaten a little bit more. No, let's seriously, come on. The minute I say fast, everyone in the congregation... Guess I won't be going through consecration. <laughs> but it's really a life and death situation. And I'm speaking spiritually here. Okay? We have to get control over ourselves. This is the only way you're going to be able to navigate properly in a sinful world without being contaminated. Most of the things, uh, no, I won't say most of the things, a lot of the things we do aren't really scriptural or biblical. We do them because everyone else is doing it. And there is no moral compass in, in your innards to say, uh uh, no, 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 just because they do it don't mean that, that, that this is not right. But sometimes we go head over heels into what everybody else is doing. You know, how you doing, baby boy? What's up, man? Don't leave without giving me a high five today. I heard you smashing it, man, out there. Keep it up, all right? All right you're going to be my next NF. You're going to be my NFL player. And you make sure you tied here at Newburgh, too. <laughs> Good to see you. We have to make sure, okay, that... We are in control of ourselves. So when the enemy starts talking like the enemy talked to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, you can come back with word. Every time the enemy came to Jesus, he came back. Jesus came back. Uh, well, the word said. Every, every time the enemy came to Jesus, Jesus responded with the word. Every time. That's control. Fasting is also a spiritual force. Turn to Joel, the book of Joel. Now, I know you don't know where it is because you don't read your Bible much, but that's okay. We're going to wait. And don't be embarrassed, even if you have to do one of these numbers. And flip through the whole book. That's okay. I always say, look in the table of contents. Why am I pressing you to look up your own Bible? Because these screens will not be here at 2 o'clock in the morning when a tragedy takes place and you need a word. You need to know how to maneuver through your own Bible or your app or whatever it is. Joel, Joel. Joel chapter 1. Give you a brief overview before we read it. Johnny, you okay today? Good. Love you. Kiss that little girl right there for me. Just kiss her for me. That's for me. 
And you better enjoy it too. <laughs> Joel chapter 1, uh, you can brief, just, just peruse through it as I talk. Joel's prophecy begins with the news of a terrible plague. <laughs> terrible plague of locusts. You see it in verses 1 through 20. And you see this wave upon wave of hungry insects. They swarm over the land like a devouring army. And, and trees have been stripped of leaf and bark. Just look at it. Fields, vineyards, orchards, all of it is ruined. Uh, you see farmers and vineyards and vine growers, they're in despair. And the priest, even scripture says, the priest has nothing to even offer the Lord. And so Joel, like a true prophet, is hated. You know, they, people don't like prophets because <laughs> they, like, they come with truth. They bear truth. And sometimes they step on your toes, sometimes. All right? And it's not in a harmful way. It's, it's in a way of correction. It's in a way of, hey, let's be careful. The Lord is calling us to this or that, and let's be careful to do this or that, or let's be careful not to be like the pagan, okay? And, you know, it doesn't feel good when somebody tells you some, something that you've been doing for a long time and that you're okay with it, and then somebody says, but the Scripture says it's not okay, and that immediately conf there's conflict. That goes on right there. And so well, this is what Joel is dealing with. And so Joel, like a true prophet, he then calls the priest and the people unto the Lord. And, he's, and he speaks of this devastation of locusts. And in this case, I'm just perusing here, you see that only God can help. Now, let's break some things down here. Joel then shifts in what we're going to read in just a second. Uh, Joel chapter 2. 2, turn to chapter 2, and look at verse 12. I'm going to begin reading there. In the second chapter, he begins to appeal to his people again. And this time, uh, he sees more of a crisis. It's going to be a cloud of locusts, but now he sees the gathering of clouds, judge God's judgment in the cloud. And he calls for the trumpet. Where's George? Is George here today? George, come up here. You didn't know you were going to do this. Where's George? Tell him. Come here real quick. It called for the trumpet to be blown. The trumpet, the shafar to be blown. We're going to have the shafar blown. Thank you for being Johnny on the spot, man. I appreciate you. Can you, can you blow? I know you hadn't warmed up, but can you blow? It calls for the shafar to be blown. We talked about this last week. Thank you. The Shafar was saying another invasion is coming of locusts, even more thorough and all-consuming than the last. Darkness and fire would envelop the whole earth. Millions of these strange horse-like creatures, they would lock up arms. Read it when you go home. Lock up arms, and they would walk like an army in sync. And they would cover the land and devour everything. But the beauty of chapter 2 is this. That chapter 2 is actually a nightmare. But it hadn't come into reality yet. It was a warning of what was impending if they didn't get some things together. So, now watch this. As we say in the hood, peep this. Peep means to look. Peep, P-E-E-P. P-E-E-P. Peep means to view, observe. Observe this. Peep this. Joel chapter 2 verse 12 says this. But even now, we see that the nightmare it's a nightmare, but it's going to become a reality. Even at this point, God says, what did he say? Read it. Declares the Lord. Do what? With, with some of your heart. Oh, with what? Fasting, weeping, and mourning. 13. What are you supposed to rip? Rend your and not your externals. Don't pretend. 
It has to be an inner conviction. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is what? And he is what? Slow to and abounding in love. And he relents from what? 14. Who knows? Look at your neighbor and say, who knows? Just who knows? Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Do you not know that if you have a grain offering or drink offering, that meant that you got an, a, a bountiful harvest enough to bring to the temple to say, hey, I got this extra here. Here you go. Fifteen. Then he says, blow the trumpet, George. Blow the trumpet in Zion. And then do what? Declare a what? Call a what? This meant that everyone was supposed to participate. You are supposed to sacrifice and participate whenever you convene and call a sacred assembly. It's for everyone. When God calls any church, any assembly, any organization, and talks to its leaders and says, we need to go into consecration, everyone under that assembly should respond because there is a blessing that's going to come over that house. And you want to be there when the rains pour from heaven on your land. Many of you have sown seeds, seeds of servitude, seeds of, of, of uh, love into different people's lives. And those seeds are going to spring up, but it takes water to break that seed open. Sixteen, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together. That's what's going to happen next week. Bring together the people, the elders. Even the children, yeah. Even, even, because nowadays the millennial moms, I don't understand, they just can't do anything. They have one or two children and their life is on hold. But y'all used to have five, six, 20 of them. (laughs) And life just kept going. But now they have one, and it shuts down the whole house. (laughs) I got two children. (laughs) I just laughed. (laughs) What would, Lord Jesus. Why do you need to bring the children? It's called teaching and training. You have to train them, Timothy says. You train yourselves in godliness. The word train comes from a Greek word, which means to exercise. They don't know what you're doing, but they learn it. They start figuring it out. And the better, it's better to train them when they're suckling on the breast. You know, studies show that children can feel things when they're in the womb. Why would you separate a baby from church? When you know God is the father. You're bringing that baby to church. Even though the baby knows nothing that's going on. They might even be somewhere drawing on a piece of paper. But they're taking in everything that's being said. Everything is her, train up a child in the way it should go. So when it grows old, it won't depart. So you're trained. They're sitting there coloring and drawing. And I bet you later on you're asking, what did pastor, pastor said this and that, that. And you thought they weren't paying attention. And it starts at a young age. Because if you don't get them when they're young, baby... When they get to be 16, it gets a little late. You get them out of the womb. You want them to be in an, in an anointed environment. Those nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom, yeah, you've had enough. Y'all don't know what that means. Those are people who just got married and they're consummating their marriage and they're still, you know, playing Tarzan and Jane. Come out of the bedroom for a little while, then you can go back to role playing. That's why you're here at New Birth. (laughs) 
Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. 17. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. I'll show you a picture of that next week. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn or a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Look at 18. Then the Lord was what? Jealous for his land. He took pity on his people and did what? Okay, now watch this. When we go through seasons of consecration, when you read on down into that text, you'll see all the blessings that are released. Isaiah 58, and read it when you go home, talks about the fact that there are, there's a certain type of fast that can break yokes. See, the devil is a lie. <laughs> Thank you, George. Satan, the blood that be against you. <laughs> Phil, change that chord out next week, please. No. <laughs> Give you this and we're going home. There are seven reasons or benefits a Christian should fast. Number one, write this in your notes. Seven basic reasons. I'm filtering this fasting concept down into these reasons. So look at this. Number one, fasting was used to seek God's forgiveness. First Samuel uh, chapter 7, you see it there. First Samuel chapter 7. I'm not going to explain all of these. You need to do some homework. All right? I've done enough. I've put it together for you. Now it's time for you to eat. Fasting was used to seek God's forgiveness. You'll see an example in First Samuel chapter 7. I don't know how many people are still dealing with the guilt from the past. Things that they've gotten involved in. 30 years ago, that they still struggle with today. That's spiritual bondage. That's bondage that the enemy has placed all over your life. And you have to, you have to combat spiritual things with spiritual things. The Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare as Christians, what we fight with, our weapons, they are not carnal. They're not physical. They're not guns. They're not knives and that, that kind of stuff. But they are powerful. To the, to the bringing down of strongholds, tearing down of strongholds. And there are certain times we have to exercise spiritual activity in order to break through spiritual uh, problems. All right? And fasting was used to seek God's forgiveness. It, would, it can help cleanse you. Sometimes the enemy speaks in your mind and in your heart and tells you how bad you are and you shouldn't have done this. And even though it happened, you're still dealing with some of the consequences. And you play this thing over and over like, a, like the old school VCR tape. Now, the young people don't know what I'm talking about. But like a DVD player, you just keep hitting the rewind button and playing it over and over again. There has to come a point where you said, no, I'm not going to listen to those negative voices anymore. I'm not going to listen to the enemy speak negativity to me. I'm going to go on a fast. I'm going to break this whole thing wide open. Isaiah says this kind of fast can break yokes. Look at this, too. It was used to seek God's favor. Ezra took a group of people back to the homeland. They were in Babylonian captivity. And uh, the king decided that some of them could go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And Ezra was nervous. He didn't want to ask the king for a military escort. And he said, I don't want to do this, God. I want them to know that you brothers, you're taking us back and you're going to take us back safely. And I want that to be a testimony to everyone in this region that we serve the one true God. So he asked for God's divine protection and favor. Look at this, three. Fasting was used to seek protection from danger. You see that again in Ezra. Uh, you see it also in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. And also in the whole book of Esther, you see a fast was called for the whole nation of Jews. Four, it was used for humbling oneself for a deeper experience with God. Too many of us have a shallow relationship with God. That's why we run around talking about, is there a God? Is there a God? I don't, I don't even know. Well, you, you would probably ask that question if you've never experienced him. If you've never taken the time to seek the face of God. I'm not just talking about saying I'm a Christian and I read a Bible verse every day. No, there, comes, there are seasons where you have to heighten your spiritual activity. 
Because if you do not do this, guess what's going to happen? You allow all the noise from the outside to continue to penetrate your life to the point that you can't hear. And it's a personal thing. You have to make a decision. And so what God will do is he'll put leaders like me on this planet to urge you to periodically sanctify yourself. That was somewhat of the symbolism. When, uh, Pastor Keyshawn, when I was out of town, and he preached a marvelous sermon on servitude, and he used the illustration of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. That in and of itself, if you study that deeply, you will see a lot in that. What else will you see in that? You will see this, that as Christians, okay, in the morning, you, let's say you bathe. But when you walk outside of your house, as you walk through the streets of Jerusalem, the dusty streets, you become dirty. And every now and then, you, when you walk into someone's home, their servant, their hired servant would come and bow down and wash your feet as a gesture of hospitality. And it's a metaphor that as Christians, as we walk throughout this life, we get dirty sometimes. Inadvertently, we get dirty. Sometimes we get dirty, don't even know we're dirty. And we have to be bathed. We don't have to be rebaptized, but just washed up a little bit. That's what consecration does. It's just, I don't have to be baptized again. I don't have to confess Jesus my Lord. He's already my Lord. But every now and then, I need to say, Father, I stretch my hand to Thee. Just every now and then. Let me get through here. Did I do four? Five. It was used to change God's mind in that it was a petition for mercy. Jonah chapter 3, verses 5 and 10. Second Samuel chapter 12, verses 16 through 22. Many of God's judgments are, watch this, conditional stipulatory six fasting was used to receive insight oh god this is a good one i've gotten i don't know how many prayer requests over the past month and i believe it's because the season is upon us uh, where people are struggling in some area of their life and they're having to make critical decisions and some decisions that even as your pastor, I wouldn't dare even give you advice on. And I have told people, we're going into consecration. This is a good time for you to put that request in and put that petition in, be it a health issue. Okay? Now, I'm serious now. When, when you're dealing with your health, sometimes you're dealing with life and death. And you have to do what you have to do to get the breakthrough that you need. Doctors are great. I love Justin. But even Justin, Dr. Justin would tell you he don't know it all. His wife would tell you <laughs> he doesn't know it all. Okay? And sometimes there are certain, and I'm being serious, there are certain situations that you can't even talk to a friend about. That you, you really have to say, I, I've got to go to the throne for this one. I've got to go. I, I don't really have time. And, and I don't have time to mess around either. Because this is a decision that needs to be made. And it's critical. Now, if you've never been in that position, keep on living. It was used to receive insight and instruction from God, Daniel chapter 9. You see it in Acts 13, 2 through 3, and in 2 Corinthians 11 through 27. Paul tells of his fastings often there. I love it. He says, I fast often. And then in the very next chapter, after Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, he says, I fast often. And in the very next chapter, he talks about visions and revelation. That, that when he came out of his fasting, all of a sudden God phew, opened up his, his eyesight and he could see clearly and he could make good, proper decisions. 
Here's the last one for today. Fasting, it was used, and I said this before, to free the captives. It's one of my favorite ones, to free the captives, Isaiah chapter 58, and you see it in Matthew chapter 17, uh, 20 through 21. Some things only come out through fasting and prayer, Jesus said. And some things you've got to dig deep. You've got to go deeper. A teen pastor is encouraging our youth to participate in consecration, and I urge you your parents to step in and help them with this. Some of you will go, and when I'm speaking about fasting, uh, we're going to be fasting starting next week, not this week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We start uh, Sunday night at 12 a.m., and we will go to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's the typical fast day, okay? Okay. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for three weeks. So you have, and this is corporate. You could do more if you want. It's up to you. Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'll come together for prayer for one hour. That's it. We'll be walking out of the door at 730. We'll come in praying. We, and and, and it's not a, it's not a playtime. Uh, We'll come in, we'll greet each other, we're going to love each other, but when we go into prayer, we, everybody's going in for themselves. And everyone has something that they, they need to hear from God on. And even some of us just go into worship, just worship. It's just worship. There are pleasures forevermore in your presence. Worship. There are some times where the enemy has just been running you ragged and you need a respite from the enemy's attacks. The best, safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. There's sometimes when you have to divorce yourself from the world. I remember when Matt was little, when we used to go into consecration, and we would tell him, he's two, three, three years old, wouldn't Sister Ebony and Kiwan, all of them, they were one, two, three years old, on their knees. Why? Because we taught them. They were on their, they didn't know what they were doing. And then again, maybe they did. Nydia, all, they were down there, three, four, just all down there praying to God, playing to God. But, <laughs> but they were taught to do that. So now they're 15, 16, 17. They do this stuff on their own. Jay, all of them, they were taught that at, at a young age. Listen, if we can teach our three- and four-year-olds STEM, science, whether it's a science, technology, engineering, mathematics at three or four. Why can't you teach them Jesus? What's so hard about that? Why is it that we, well, that's just too much for them. No, it's not. There were kings in the Bible at the age of seven. Now, they didn't make all of the decisions. They had a tutor or a guardian. But it shows the power of youth. Jesus says, suffer not the little children to come unto me. Let them come. Even if they're crying, so what? Teach them. Teach them. You got to, it has to start somewhere. It doesn't matter. And we don't mind them crying. They'll be just fine. I promise you, blow blow that little snotty nose and sit in that chair. Amen? Amen? You have to teach and train them. We teach them everything else. We teach them how to do a, a three-point shot. We teach them at two or three years old, this is how you dribble the ball. And at two, three, yeah, yeah. Come in here. We're going to pray now. And make it fun. Come on, we're going to talk to Jesus. Who Jesus? Come on, let's see. <laughs> they can be taught. I promise you, man. I promise you they can be taught. And it's critical because you need your household in order. All right, somebody give the Lord a big praise. Um, Now give the Lord a praise. That was good. Can you hold your neighbor's hand as you stand? Consecration season is a small sacrifice for a big blessing. Super small sacrifice for a big blessing. In Jesus. Y'all help me. Oh. To 
bear. What a privilege. Ooh, hear that? What a privilege to what? To carry everything. Everything to God in prayer. Do that one, one, more, one more time. Ricky, Rick, can you lead that? What? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege. A privilege. 